teaching AI to speak DNA. You are here because you want to stay on top of the latest thinking about AI for uh, biotech. Ginkgo's mission is to make biology easier to engineer. It's pretty clear by now that AI is going to make biology easier to engineer. How much easier? How quickly? Many of the people in our audience today are well positioned for AI revolution. You're the ones who are going to build the products that AI makes possible. Ginkgo is going to be the platform that helps you do it. And Google is going to be the platform that helps us do it. At Ginkgo, we've been using AI for a few years now, particularly in our protein engineering and biosecurity operations. So we know how powerful it can be. We know how to make it work. We are pros, at least as much as anybody can be, given how fast things are moving right now. Uh, but now is the right time to ramp up the AI conversation because current events have brought things into focus. We see the future of AI at Ginkgo more clearly now than we did a month ago. That future is going to be shaped by our partnership with Google Cloud. On August 29th, Ginkgo and Google Cloud announced a strategic five-year partnership, Cloud and AI. Ginkgo will build large language models for biological engineering applications powered by Vertex AI, the Google Cloud platform. Ginkgo is transitioning to Google as our primary cloud service provider, using their compute infrastructure, their AI stack. The partnership includes funding from Google to enable Ginkgo's development of foundation models and fine-tuned applications. Foundation models and fine-tuned applications. And I want to pause on that for a moment because I think that language is a useful framework to understand what we're working on here. Foundation models and fine-tuned applications differ in terms of the scale of the data that they require and the scope of the problem that they solve. Foundation models are very large. They open up an entire problem space. Fine-tuned applications are smaller, more focused. They're often built on top of those larger models. We can see this relationship in tech where foundation models like BERT or GPT are trained on very large corpuses of text and they learn the patterns of natural human language. They can enable a wide range of fine-tuned applications that deploy that general capability in a specific context, often with additional training data. We also see that relationship in AI for bio. Foundation models like AlphaFold are trained with large data sets, for example, structural data from the protein data bank. They learn the global rules of protein folding Fine-tuned models build on top of that capability to generate protein structures of specific types or for specific applications. At Ginkgo, we're interested in both foundation and fine-tuned models. Both of them require data. Data is what we are good at here at Ginkgo. We say data is queen. What we bring to the table in AI is our capacity to generate data in the foundry high throughput automation, omics, sequencing, other technologies. The partnership with Google Cloud and Vertex AI is about unlocking the power of that data, and then making that power available to you and the audience, our partners. Today's discussion will be organized into segments. Uh, what is the Ginkgo and Google Cloud partnership? How does Ginkgo use AI today? What does it take to use AI effectively in bio? What does it mean for you? And then some open Q&A with the audience. And so for that last segment, I want to direct your attention to the Q&A feature in the bottom of your Zoom window. You can use that to ask us any question at all on the topic of AI, and we'll do our best to get you an answer. That feature is open now, so you can ask away and I will pose your questions to our panelists at the opportune time. And with that, let's say hello to our panelists. Hello, panelists. Uh, first, we've got Scott. Scott Penberthy is Managing Director of Applied AI at Google Cloud's Office of the CTO. His team applies current and upcoming AI technologies to help people live longer, healthier lives. Welcome, Scott. Oh no, did we lose Scott? Oh no, right, you'll be right back. Uh, we've got Anna Marie. We've got Anna Marie Wagner. 
Anne Marie is our senior VP of corporate development. She negotiated this partnership with Google, and she can speak to Ginkgo's global strategy on AI. Thank you so much for being here, Anna Marie. Thanks for having me. We've got Jennifer Whip. Jenna is Ginkgo's head of commercial for cell engineering. Her role today is to make sure that all of these fancy technologies deliver solutions that our customers need. Nice to see you, Jen. Thanks, I'm excited to be here. We've got Seth. Seth Ritter is our senior protein engineer here at Ginkgo. Uh, most days you can catch him in the foundry designing engineered organisms, including with AI. Hello, Seth. Hello, thank you for having me. We've got Nicole Stevenson. Nicole is Director of Data Science and Modeling at Concentric by Ginkgo. Uh, we'll be looking at her for practical insights for applied AI in biosecurity. Thank you for joining us, Nicole. Hi, nice to be here. Uh, and we've got Dimitri. Dimitri is Ginkgo's Vice President of AI Enablement. His job is to oversee the full stack of AI tools that we're putting into place here at Ginkgo. Welcome, Dimitri. Thank you, excited for the conversation. All right. So I wanted to start it here with thinking about just the, the global shape of this deal. And so uh, this question is for you, Anna Marie. Tell me about how this partnership is going to work and what we're hoping will come out of it. Sure, happy to do that. And, and hopefully while I'm speaking, Scott uh, from Google is going to find a way to uh, to reconnect because I know that he's excited to talk about this from, from Google's perspective as well. Um, look, I mean, Jake, you mentioned it at the beginning, like Google's been, or sorry, Ginkgo has been using uh, AI and ML techniques for a long time, but mainly around building what you described as these fine-tuned applications on top of other leading models. Because um, the largest need really in the early days of AI ML was this like high-quality labeled training data, which is what, if you think about Google's platform, or, man, I am just having these radiant slips. What Ginga's platform does, it's producing that labeled training data. Um, and, and what became clearer over time is that the, the code base that we've also accumulated, you know, so a couple billion proprietary protein sequences would also allow us to build better foundation models. And so with those better foundation models, we can also improve the results of all those task specific models that we've been building and, and using already on customer programs for things like enzyme optimization and engineering. Um, so we really decided it was time for us to invest in building that part of our platform, kind of the same way that we have invested in building the physical infrastructure in our foundry or accumulating those code base assets. Um, when we started talking with Google, it was it was clear there was just a really nice chemistry. We, we really think about a lot of these problems in the same way. We are both driven by um, just making these technologies better. Um, and honestly, so much of what our industry looks at as the gold standard for AI and ML was developed at Google. Um, Jake obviously mentioned and is, is now using and playing with AlphaFold. Um, and in, in some of our earliest conversations with that team over at DeepMind who, who works on protein engineering and worked on AlphaFold, they sort of had one of those aha moments that Jake was referring to where you know, they ask like, okay, so if we can generate, say, like a thousand model predictions, you know, with our latest protein models, you could actually test those for functional properties in the foundry. And I was like, yes, like that, that is what Ginkgo does every single day for our customers. And, you know, I, I think in the early days of our industry, sometimes that was critiqued as, you know, throwing spaghetti against the wall, doing brute force experimentation. And what we've sort of realized is all that brute force work and spaghetti on the wall has created data that is incredibly powerful and a capability that is incredibly powerful to generate the kind of data that we need for these models. And so I think that interaction just really cemented the foundation for the relationship that, that Ginkgo and, and Google have now built. And, and Google was able to offer us the infrastructure at scale, and Dimitri, I think, can, can speak more to this, but that would allow us to build these really transformational models. Um, and then I think, you know, just to, to round out, and, and it, might, it looks like uh, Scott is hopefully reconnected, but but in thinking through how Google views this, this space in our industry, they're really interested in making sure the best models are built and are available and are running on their cloud platform. And, and Ginkgo sort of has this unique role in the industry where we're, if we build good tools, we can bring more folks from the industry into 
the AI realm and into the ability to use computational tools. And so um, we're really honored that that Google has decided to to help fund some of those efforts as well. Um, and, and Scott, I see you're back. So so welcome back. And, and I know I'm excited to hear about it from Google's perspective as well. Right. Well, thanks, Anna Marie. So 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 Ginkgo's the bio platform here, Google's the tech platform. Scott, tell me a little bit about this partnership from Google's perspective. How does your team see the opportunities in AI for biotech? And how does the partnership with Ginkgo fit into that vision? Yeah, one is, um, I think we're just thrilled. There's, there's def definitely a buzz in some, inside Google and DeepMind about a Ginkgo partnership. You know, my, I think when it was announced, my, my phone lit up like a Christmas tree. Um, and I think what we're seeing here, Jake, is that it's a simple observation. Um, you know, biology itself is becoming a computational discipline. Um, and I think recently with the cost of next generation sequencing plummeting, we're now able to look at things at a nanoscale. Uh, but that data is so large, you, needed, you need very basically large models to understand them. And so that's why we're really sort of excited about the partnership with Ginkgo in the sense that we've been doing sort of AI and reasoning with tensors for about, I guess, 15 years with consumer space. And now we're looking into the biology space saying, well, how do you now reason with this in a, in a new computational medium? And I think what that needs, like you said before, is a lot of data. And so as we get into that, we're looking at how do we take the models and the techniques and the stacks that we've built to basically do a, a trillion searches a year and use that infrastructure to help out in biology. And then, you know, I'm in this personally because, you know, I lost my mom to cancer many years ago. And I think it's, you know, we're trying to figure out now how can we actually change science to be much more data driven. I mean, I, you know, healthcare and, uh, and things like that to be much more data driven. And there's no company better than Ginkgo in terms of having the data, understanding proteins at a very fundamental level. I think we're going to learn so much from each other. So we're really excited to basically partner with Ginkgo and, and using these new AMOs to understand molecules and basically the, the, the software of life. I'm excited too. And I think our, I think our customers are also going to be excited. Um, Jen... Tell me about this deal from the perspective of our customers. How do we expect this to change what, what, what we can offer uh, as a biotech platform? Yeah, I think, I mean, I spend most of my time thinking about how we ensure our platform is transformative for our partners and how we ensure we deliver to our, our customers and partners. And I think folks have already mentioned that we're no stranger to AI today, and, and that's available to the work that we're doing now on the platform. To me, this is really a supercharge, a sort of acceleration of what we've been building at Ginkgo now with the power of Google Cloud, you know, our data, our ability to grow that data set really rapidly. I think we really are going to push the limits here further and faster. And what that means for customers is that we can advance sort of the work that we are already doing, but we can also start to, um, well, look, we're a partner-driven com uh, company, right? And so we're building out things that are useful to, to our customers, like things that you need to do to advance research and development for the products that you're making. And so a lot of this will be some really great discussion and ideation about what, how we're building something that's really useful for, for folks to be transformative in their industries. Um, things that might be in your pipeline already and things that might not be in your pipeline yet because they're perceived as too difficult. Uh, so we're really excited to tackle some of those challenges. All right, very cool, very cool. Um, all right, so for the next segment, I want to do a bit of a deeper dive into how we tackle those challenges today. I wanna to talk a little bit about how Ginkgo uses AI today. And so for that, I'm gonna bring on um, our technical team. Um, and we'll start with you, Seth. Can you tell me a little bit about how Ginkgo uses AI for a typical enzyme engineering project? Certainly. Um, so at Kinko, the way that we approach uh, particular enzyme engineering problems is we aim to first understand deeply the particulars of the problem itself for the customer. So whether that be an issue of expression, catalytic activity, particular functionality, things like that. Um, and so once we have like a definition of the problem, then we kind of turn to a large suite of different tools uh, that we use to try to tackle that. And so, you know, early on, uh, one thing's been talked about is like, you know, we have large protein sequence assets. And so we can mine those using a variety of different techniques to find very good starting points uh, for these enzyme applications. 
And then once we have particular templates and we're trying to optimize them in a particular functionality, that's where we really turn to a suite of tools that leverage both physics-based approaches, so things like molecular dynamics, as well as a large breadth of different machine learning and AI-based tooling. So these are focusing on things like AlphaFold, uh, large sequence models like ESM, or models that are more specific for that sequence to structure or structure to sequence mapping, such as protein and DNA. And we pull all these different resources together and utilize a system that we internally call OWL that allows us to perform this kind of iterative learning uh, in the context of particular projects in order to optimize for a protein function. And so this slide here is kind of showing a case study example, like a real world customer project that we conducted that utilizes the whole suite of what I just described. And so prior to this slide, we actually endeavored to find and uh, starting point enzymes for this reaction that were better than the things that our customer had at the time, and which actually, as a starting point, were already very active. And so we were interested then in how can we push that activity even further. And so what you're seeing on this slide is as we move from left to right, these are different generations or sets of designs for this particular application. And so uh, at the top, you see this library size. And so these are the actual number of, syn of synthesized genes which we then went forward and tested. And what you can see is as we move from left to right, early on design approaches focus on these broad hypothesis-based uh, questions, kind of like exploration problem, gathering lots of information. And as we move further and further along, we get more sophisticated design methodologies and switch more and more into machine learning focused applications. And so you can see in particular with our OWL-based framework, we move almost entirely to that, such that the final generation is only 100 designs that we actually synthesize, and we were able to achieve overall a 10x improvement of the catalytic efficiency of this enzyme. Thanks, Seth. I, so I, I'm very interested in this, this pattern of lots of data at the beginning, diverse design methodologies at the beginning, that are then sort of funneling down towards as the as as the models are being trained towards more focused data sets, more high performance uh, designs. Do do you is do you think that's going to be a general pattern in in AI design for for biology? I think so, especially kind of like this leverage of the exploration versus exploitation problem in machine learning more broadly. So early on, depending on the problem, depending on how much information we have. And so this can be information that comes from like knowledge-based systems, whether it's experts, or it can come from like AI machine learning prediction tools that kind of like look over our code base or the other uh, uh, features that we have at our disposal. Um, and early on, really, you want to gather kind of like very complex information that is specific to the problem of interest. Um, because you find, you know, for particular applications, you know, the expression context, the exactness of the enzyme, uh, like kinetic characterization, those feed in a lot into like what the actual best performing thing is. And so I think a lot of these future decisions will follow this kind of pattern of gathering lots of information about the system and funneling down as we get a better sequence to function mapping. Right. I, I think another, another um, uh, something else that was interesting to me is, is the, the way that you mentioned the, the many other design methodologies that we employ in a particular project. So you mentioned, so there's, there's structure guided uh, prediction, there's physical docking, um, for example. So it's, you know, even, even in the AI, an AI stack, AI is not the only software. It's not the, it's not the only player. So uh, I wonder, can you tell me a little bit more about how these, how the, these different software tools play together? Yeah. So the way that versus is really that the a lot of the more kind of like hypothesis driven kind of knowledge based systems like uh, physics based approaches like when we use molecular dynamics, um, these are help us really concretely define the problem space and parameterize our like design objectives. And then when we turn to some of these more like machine learning, those highly parameterized, well defined problems become the constraints when we're doing like sequence-based optimization. And so that I think is where there's like a nice pairing between these two methodologies because we can really hone in and we find that doing this kind of uh, interaction between these two suites of tools helps to alleviate some of the issues we you know like the binds variance trade-offs uh, you see when people approach these machine learning problems. Right, great, okay, thanks. Um, okay, so now to, to shift gears a little bit, I'm, no, I'm noticing a, a question in the chat. Is this, is this partnership going to be only about proteins? 
Um, and no, it isn't. It's, it's, it's going to be about many different types of biological data. So I think we're, we want to offer here uh, a cross-section, um, a, a sort of a compare and contrast of another way that we use AI currently today at Ginkgo, and that is for applications in, uh, in biosecurity. Um, and so for that, we'll bring on Nicole. Uh, Nicole, tell me about the kind of models that your team is building for biosecurity. What does Ginkgo currently do with AI and what can AI bring to those kinds of projects? Yeah, um, so I'm on the epidemiology and modeling team within Concentric, um, and Concentric is Ginkgo's biosecurity branch um, that was launched in 2020 in response to COVID-19. Um, and it initially started by developing COVID-19 testing programs in K-12 schools um, across the U.S. Um, but since then, um, we've pivoted to focus more on expanding our biosurveillance network internationally um, with airport testing programs and biosurveillance programs in several countries. Um, and we're now testing for many other pathogens um, besides COVID-19. Um, so on the epidemiology and modeling team, um, our work focuses on developing modeling tools to help us monitor and predict geographic and temporal patterns of disease risk um, that can be used to improve biosurveillance and public health interventions. Um, our team uses AI to both capture data um, as well as analyze the data. So for our analyses, we find machine learning techniques um, are very useful when dealing with the large complex data sets um, that we're using. So we typically use supervised machine learning um, algorithms that utilize training data sets. So an example here is the use of boosted regression trees to predict geographic risk of disease emergence. Um, and these methods create decision tree based ensemble models um, that use boosting, boosted um, regression to improve model performance. Jake, you're on mute. Tell me a little bit more about the process for building a new model in biosecurity. So what does it look like when you, you know, you've got a new data stream or, there, or maybe there's a new application um, and you need to, 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 to include that into your, into your model or into your software stack? What, is, what does that process look like today? Yeah, so we usually start with a new application, um, so a need for a model. Um, and first we go out and identify a training data set, um, which for us is typically some kind of disease surveillance data. Um, and this data has a lot of challenges in and of itself. Um, and we do use different machine learning functions to actually um, curate that data. Um, after we have our training data set, we'll go out and look for epidemiologically relevant predictor data sets. Um, and this is really the fun part when we go out and explore new types of data that we want to integrate into our models. Um, I'll say a, a pain point here is we spend a lot of time looking at new data sets that don't actually end up um, suiting our needs. Um, so that's definitely um, a hard part that we run into. Um, but then once we have our data, we decide what type of models we're going to try. Um, and uh, like I mentioned earlier, we find decision tree models to work really well for um, our types of data. Cool. So I, I know your team were, so Scott's going to be happy to hear this. Uh, your, team, your team were early adopters. Of uh, of Google Cloud platform here around Ginkgo, and I know that you were you were big fans, you were big evangelists for the for the platform. Um, so tell me, so what were the advantages? What what are, what are the advantages of building a uh, building models on on GCP? Yeah, so we trialed GCP several years ago um, and found it really useful for our team. Um, so we switched our platform over all onto GCP. Um, we found that the GCP console makes it very easy um, to use. Um, the organization of services um, and interdependencies makes development and deployment really easy for us. Um, we're data scientists and modelers and not um, DevOps software people. So um, we found that it was incredibly easy for us to use 
super e easy to scale up machines and get what you need. Um, we can create large clusters of machines when we need to. Um, and so we were just really happy um, with overall the functionality and ease of use. Awesome. I love to hear it. I love to hear it. Um, okay, as we as we wrap up this this more technical segment, I think I, I'm seeing a relevant question here from the audience. Um, what is being done to ground truth the data that is being generated? How long until we get to a point where the resource can be reliable without fact checking? And that maybe that's a maybe that's a Dimitri question. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good question. Um, in I imagine it comes from a lot of familiarity with sort of the natural language uh, AI uh, world that's been emerging, where um, so-called hallucinations uh, are are a big issue, uh, where the, the the model essentially generates uh, an answer that's not based in reality, um, and uh, and I think it's a it's a big problem in AI for bio as well because if you generate some proteins that are supposed to have a certain function, um, how do you actually know they do? Um, and uh, the great news here is that for Ginkgo, um, fundamentally, we have um, the sort of ground truth generating machines in our foundry and all of our investment in automation and um, and and kind of in-situ testing, right? So any, first off, we generate the data sets that we can train on. Uh, if we need new data sets, we can generate those using the foundry and any kind of predictions or anything else that our models come up with can be tested uh, in practice uh, in the lab. Um, and we don't expect uh, for the foreseeable future to be in a world where um, the model spits out the one perfect answer and that's just, uh, and, and it's a perfect oracle. Uh, I think that's um, what we're looking for here is a, is a massive augmentation of scientists' capabilities, um, but uh, there's always going to be a need for a lab to actually reduce the, uh, to, to actually test the predictions in practice. Um, right. yeah, and that's kind of the paradigm. That's right. That's it. Yeah. And yeah. Jacob, right, so, right, that's, that's, that's the foundry. The found, yeah. foundry is our, that's our, it's our ground truth factory. Right, we got we're making ground truth all day long in the foundry. Yeah, and maybe Jake, if you don't mind, I'll just add one other thing to it. <clears throat> I, I do think there's a world in which certain types of problems could get easy, and 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 where these models could actually be fairly reliable, fairly quickly. Um, you know, certain types of hey, I want to improve the thermostability of this enzyme or something like that. But that's a problem that you know you could imagine in a period of time we could all we could all sort of think about could could become an easy problem that could be solved largely computationally. And, and, and we see certain snippets of that problem already inside Ginkgo in our protein engineering team and our DNA design team where, where certain problems have gotten gotten much easier. I think the way we think about it is that's like step 0 0.5 in actually understanding biology, right? And, and there are a lot of problems like that that will need to get easy before you can actually start solving the hard problems. And, and so as we think about where are we investing, where are we spending our resources, we still see a huge need to have this physical platform for testing biological design. It's just the type of the, the type of things we'll be testing will evolve over time. We'll be able to work on harder and harder problems as the easier problems are able to be either augmented or, or maybe soon fully solved using computational tools. Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. So I think let's let's dig a little deeper now into what is it going to take to use AI effectively. So in term, uh, on the technical side, but also as an as an organization, uh, in terms of the software tools, in terms of the AI platform that we are um, that we're deploying here. Um, so first question is for Scott. What makes for a good AI platform? How can Google Cloud make models easier to build and to deploy? I, I think when we get it right, Jake, um, you don't have to think about it. I mean, the, the idea is that how do we make the platform so easy to use that you focus more on the science and not things about, well, did I set up Kubernetes right? Do I have the right NVIDIA accelerator? And how, how do I do the cross connect? I mean, that should just go away. And I think, you know, we're, we're starting to see it now, a very good question you just had in Q&A about, you know, how do you know these are grounded in truth? I think what we're starting to see is that this is becoming, if not a tool of science, a partner in science. 
And, you know, my friends at NASA, they call these, a lot of these AI tools, the idiot savant. And I laugh, I said, what do you mean? They said, well, it allows me to iterate so much faster. Like the Harvard study just came out 40% fast, you know, improvement in, in productivity. But what you do is you take the output from AI that I'll be building with uh, Dimitri and the team. And then you use this in the good old fashioned in situ and the things they've known for years in, in data science and whatnot to validate and test. And if we do it right, you can dramatically shorten the search space uh, by orders of magnitude. And that to me is so exciting. And I think Jake, if you look at where we are today with the foundation models and the techniques, it's very, very early. It's only a few, about eight months into it so far. I think we have a long way to go as a community to make it that easy as search. But that's sort of the true north for me is that you, we want to make it so that you don't have to think about it. And it's a natural partner in science. And you know it's working well when you don't have to worry about it. Absolutely. That's absolutely, I mean, the dream, the dream. Bi biology as easy as search. Um, that's a, it's a beautiful vision. Um, I can, I, I can feel the how the arrival of ai to biology seems to bring with it more of these these tech like uh metaphors search uh and with that comes the need maybe for a more tech like mentality um so a question for dimitri how are we thinking about data that is biological in origin but is going to be generated for analysis with ai are we taking a sort of a, a tech perspective on on how we use this data yeah, uh, and uh, I suspect to a lot of people in the audience, uh, the the answers here aren't going to be anything new. Um, there's a core set of principles that's uh, fairly well publicized and known, uh, abbreviated as FAIR. That stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, and uh, it's important that when we generate the data uh, through whatever kind of experiment we're running, um, it doesn't just go sort of into a notebook, into a, a slide, uh, but uh, it is created in a sort of reusable way that captures uh, what this data was, how this data was generated, what it represents, what the, all the parameters were, and so on. Um, and that's not kind of a tech team or a data team problem, ensuring that data capture is complete and can be interpreted uh, and can be found later. Um, is it starts with experimental design execution. So there's some amount of just thinking a little bit differently, uh, as well as having systems that allow you to uh, to capture all that data. Um, uh, there's no amount of data cleaning or AI that can sort of help fix the data when you just straight up didn't catch it, uh, didn't capture it. Um, that said, biology uh, it has huge variety. There's always new tricks and challenges. There are very few actually hard rules. Um, so. Uh, it's also the case that that software folks and people coming out of the tech world have um, have a lot to learn, need a lot of humility working working in these in this environment, uh, and that's what keeps it fun. Yeah, I think that's I think I think that's fair. I think that's fair, and I think maybe some so somebody I know who's who's doing it right is uh, is you, Scott. Is you, Scott? Um, so you're you're a, you're a software guy. You're coming into the to the bio world. You seem pretty comfortable. You seem pretty conversant. What would be your advice to our audience, people who are working in a bio-based industry today who want to get ahead of the curve on, on AI? Well, it's um, I work a lot in this area. Um, I guess we call it phenomics. So if you look at the, the history of a lot of the biology, you work with a very you know, maybe a sparse data set and you have sort of markers and you do sort of correlations and, and basic, you know, logistic regression for many years drove a lot of the insights. Um, if you take that and start to think about, well, what about other modalities, right? And that, and so the basic idea of, you know, fitting a curve, fitting a line, logistic regression, and that was done with markers. But now think about what about sequences themselves? And how do you represent a sequence in, a, in, in bas basically a vector space? How do you look at images? How do you look at other things you get from the lab? And now you're doing the same sort of math, but on, but on richer data sets. And these data sets tend to be rather large. And so that allows you not only to find these relationships, but once you understand the language, you can then turn around and do synthesis as well. And so that's sort of the natural evolution. So if, if this seems a little foreign to you, it may be exciting, but that's kind of the basic science that we're seeing is you're just sort of extending the modalities. But now we have what people used to call hyperscale AI. We're seeing it now with these large language models, large protein models, LPMs, for example. Um, and that's really exciting. And I think there's a, there's a question you saw in the Q&A. People said, well, you know, how, how do you know about if you have all the things we've got for all these different proteins and molecules, 
What about rare molecules? And what we're seeing of some of these larger models is these emergent properties, where it starts to grok and understand the language of life itself and make internal representations that we can use for statistics. And these internal representations start to have capabilities we can now infer things that we didn't really see before. So we saw that in human language, where we train models on, let's say, you know, the, the top 20 languages, but a language like Japanese wouldn't have a lot of sample data, right? Because it's, it's a very popular language, but a small population. We're able to translate Japanese because it started to understand the human language function. So I think that's really exciting. I left the work with Dimitri and the team and learned from both of us and, and the team here to say, as we start to understand molecules and proteins and, and the structure, are we going to start to see emergent properties as it's starting to be a real partner for us in the tool of science? Right, right. So, so we're 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 on the lookout for these emergent properties where solving one problem is going to make the next problem easier. Um, and you know, maybe what we're looking out for is you know sometimes these problems are they can fall like a like a set of dominoes. Yeah, and no, I think um, we do. I'm seeing, if we do that, yeah, if we do that, Jake, the idea is that we'll, it'll start to be this partner in our in our science exploration. And it'll start to generate molecules or ideas that we can then test ourselves and say, no, that's pretty interesting. And that could venture into new spaces and actually maybe reduce the time to reduce and find these new, you know, emergent enzymes, right? Um, so I think it's it's going to be a really exciting time. And, you know, I think once we ink the partnership, Dimitri's already calling me the next day, we got to get started. <laughs> and so, so I'm really excited about the pace, rate and pace we're going we're gonna to see together here. Yeah, I think so. I see a relevant question here in the chat as this as this thinking about how the the, the pace of discovery uh, is accelerating. Uh, how do you see the intellectual landscape unfolding? Uh, one company patenting entire libraries or someone skilled in the art using AI. So nothing is patentable. Um, and uh, I'll ask that question to you, Anna Marie Wagner, is the is the pace of change going to be so fast here? Uh, that were that were the that the intellectual property landscape is is uh, is uh, forever disrupted. Uh, there are a lot of people who are thinking about this question right now, and, and I, I think there's we're at a really unique moment where like the basis of competition in our industry is fundamentally changing, and what we consider to be kind of core IP is, is also fundamentally changing. And, and I think, I don't think our industry has figured it out yet, to be clear. I, I don't think in natural language, we, we figured out what the copyright law is going to look like anymore, right? There there are cases that are are being dis, being debated right now about exactly this topic. And, and that's obviously going to have huge ripple effects in our industry as well. Yeah, I mean, to the to the question that was asked, can can I just create a model and like patent everything that comes out of my model? You know, like that that probably seems unreasonable, but there there's 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 going to be some middle ground that we have to find to continue to incentivize and protect the development of life-saving products, but that also allow for creativity and innovation. And um, we're really looking forward to, to partnering with our customers on this topic. And, and I would say that, you know, even Ginkgo's philosophy around this stuff is, 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 you know, being evaluated, right? Like what, what is the, what is the right approach in, in, in these, in these models, right? Where does the data reside? Where does, what, what is the, what is the breadth of the license, right? Like these are all conversations that we're having as we talk about building, potentially releasing AI models. What, what I'm very confident in is that, you know, we'll continue and Jen, Jen can talk to this better than I can. We'll continue to work closely with our customers to figure out what is that model that gives the customer what they need to successfully bring a product to market. That, that at the end of the day is, is what matters in our space. Um, but I think that we're, we're just in a really interesting moment where we're all trying to figure this out, figure this out together. Yeah, I think that's right, right? So that is that is our you know, ground truth, if you like, is that we, we're here to enable more customers to bring more products to market. And that's what success looks like. Um, and that's, that's how our AI tech needs to be shaped. Um, Jen, can you can you elaborate a little bit about what all this is going to mean for our customers? How how is AI tech going to improve our existing offerings and maybe expand them? Yeah, and I think you know Seth uh, outlined a little bit about how we use AI today. Uh, I think we also you have ho hopefully gotten a sense of what we're trying to build that gives you an idea of how that can advance the work. But if I can sharpen that a little bit, um, I would say 
you know, we're thinking about this again as a huge accelerator. We can do sort of, uh, you know, protein engineering and and enzyme uh, engineering and discovery with our tools today. But imagine what it looks like when you have the tools that Scott described as sort of, you know, idiot savant, kind of you don't have to th think. And my, my small alteration there would be that Perhaps this actually offers you the ability to think, right? It, when you can simplify um, the hard work through AI, for example, it opens up the ability to spend that brain space doing some of the harder work of, of making that into a product, bringing that into market, like figuring out how to have something really meaningful that, that changes the supply chain or changes a therapeutic or whatever that might be. And I think about this like maybe, um, since we have some analogies, like maybe driving to, to a new workplace, right? The first time you do that, you have to think about that quite a bit. You have to think about what turn you're going to make. And as you do, as you get better and better about that, it becomes like autonomous, right? You don't have to, I don't remember what stoplights I, I stopped at on the way into work. And instead, I was thinking about all the really interesting things I was going to do today. And that's what's going to, I think, open up um, some of this space for us, uh, us here. And, and today, I think the work that we're doing in AI is more like a, a compass, right? It's guiding us in the direction we're sort of heading north, and then we look up and and see where we are. I think tomorrow, I hope it is Google Maps, right? It tells us exactly turn by turn where to go, where we're going to have traffic, where we're going to get coffee on the way to work, mm -hmm. and how that translates to our products is where might we have toxicity problems? Where might we have to have extra rounds of engineering? Where might we um, be able to find a better production host? And so. I, I really think there's a, a ton of opportunity here that translates into not just bringing products that are already in our customers' pipelines to market today, but also opens the aperture on what's possible, right? P products or problems that seem intractable now, maybe they're too far to meet COGS, maybe um, the time to market is too long, if something has ruled it out. I think all of that becomes uh, becomes possible as we build out some of these tools. Yeah, I really I really like the the Google Maps here. I think that's really it's right. It's very it's it works alongside you as a human. It opens up uh, brain space for 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 human creativity. It allows you to to focus on other tasks, right? And I think, and, you know, in this analogy it would be allows our, our customers to focus on bringing their products uh, to market. But I also, so I'm, I'm also interested in the Google Maps analogy because in order to deliver that incredible functionality, Google Maps needs your data, right? It needs your, it needs your location data. Um, and so how does, how does that look in, in AI for biospace, right? I know, I think this is, this is something that people are, concerned about, something that people are really thinking about. Will my data be accessible via these models? How is Google or oh my God, how is Ginkgo? We have to, we have too many G's. We need to, somebody's got to, oh my God. How is Ginkgo thinking about data privacy and data ownership? Yeah, it should be a conversation, needs to be a conversation. We're, we're thinking about it a lot too. And clearly AI is changing the paradigm for how Ginkgo and our partners think about data. You know, if we continue on the Google Maps kind of analogy, uh, I benefited from a route to uh, my workplace today, but I didn't see your route, Jake. You know, I didn't see the traffic steps you made. And so there's a really nice kind of like build of that data usefulness. But I think, and, and Dimitri can maybe talk about how we think about that from a technical perspective and how we deal with data today. But the bottom line is, is that we'll be working really closely with our customers to align our data privacy and terms and, and things that meet our customers' needs and priorities. And Again, because we are not making products, we're helping our customers make products. We want to make sure that that uh, that our customers are are able to do that. So there's more to come here, but and, and we'll have to be thinking about it together. Uh, Dimitri, same same question for you. Um, speak to this on the on the technical side. How is how is how is Ginkgo thinking about data privacy, data ownership, in terms of the tech that we're building? Yeah, well, first of all, uh, just because 
I, I think uh, when people talk about synthetic biology and healthcare and other things, oftentimes uh, some folks kind of leap to the, my DNA uh, is gonna be in Ginkgo's models. And um, to be clear, right, like, uh, at least at the moment, uh, I'm not on the business side and the, that kind of strategy side, but uh, at, at the moment, we're not taking anybody's sort of personal DNA samples and training models on them, right? So let's just like be clear on that part um, as far as data privacy is concerned. Um, now, uh, we do have a lot of data sets uh, about biology, about all kinds of uh, DNA experiment, uh, experimental results and so on. Um, and in many cases, we're working with partners who have various levels of sensitivity to um, that data being in some way shared with, with other partners um, of ours potentially, or, or, or used to enable other partners. Uh, so uh, there's a bunch of kind of uh, contractual uh, uh, safeguards that we could put in place, but we're also thinking about it on the technical side where we're putting measures in place to make sure that uh, we have um, clear data lineage uh, so that for any model, we know exactly what went into it and what the associated restrictions with it were and what the ownership there was. Um, and we're also thinking about things like uh, various guardrails uh, set on the output of the models uh, so that we can check them both for privacy concerns uh, or data ownership concerns, as well as for uh, any kind of biosecurity um, implications. Right on, right on. So yeah, so we know we know these things are they're our top of mind for a lot of our customers and, and therefore they're top of mind for us. And it's going to be a very important conversation um, that we, uh, uh, that is, that is ongoing. And I think on that, and part of it happening today, and I, so on that topic, I want to make sure we have, we have enough time here for some audience Q&A. Um, a lot of people are already using the Q&A feature. I love that. It's right down at the bottom of the your screen uh, on Zoom. You can, you can type uh, your questions in there, any questions at all, and I will pose them to our panel here. Um, and I see some some quite interesting ones here. This okay, so this one is on the technical side. So I'll I'll activate I think Seth uh, for this one. Artificial intelligence AI necessitates vast volumes of data. Historically, metabolic modeling has focused on a limited number of organisms. Uh, what potential do you see in creating robust metabolic models for lesser known organisms like archaea? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Um, so I guess a couple of different little way, lay, ways to approach the problem. First, just kind of like reflecting on what Ginkgo has and like what we've been exposed to. Um, so one of the things we you know kind of gloss over is like the scale of the data that we already have internally. And so whether that's you know like sequence repositories, which you know um, we have about two billion unique protein sequences in them whether it's, you know, particular like assay label data, so different arrayed experiments that we've done with different enzymes, which at this point, you know, is, you know, millions of individually sampled enzymes, both variants and metagenomic sourced things, where we know, like, is this active, like, yes or no, we know the context of that activity. And then also we have a lot of data on many different types of organisms. Um, so Ginkgo has worked with, you know, a variety of different organisms beyond just, you know, the standard E. coli, yeast, things like that. Um, for, uh, you know, the past like decade and a half. Um, and so I think like when I think about the AI approach to like this particular problem, uh, the question is kind of like, how do you layer on the levels of like the system's understanding into like this particular space? So if we have the ability, for example, to genomically understand like a particular archaea, you can begin to ask questions of, okay, here are the underlying enzymes that we believe are being expressed in this organism under certain conditions. Here are the related enzymes that we know and we've studied. Here's their activities, things like that. And it's from this information that the AI systems are able to build like a systems level understanding of the metabolism of these kinds of organisms. And that can serve as like a relatively good starting point for when we can pose questions like how should we actually grow this organism? How can we potentially do other types of engineering? And then of course, turning the foundry loop of now we can really start to probe it a little bit deeper and enhance those models. Yes, I think so. I, that's a that's a really interesting use case to me. That's something close to my heart, and I think it, it speaks to something that um, that Scott mentioned earlier. Is I like it, with AI, there's 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 the potential. We often see the emergent potential for these models to generalize. Um, 
to some extent outside of their original training data. And so I think it, in particular, the, the use case of, well, okay, let's make, what about a metabolic, metabolic model for a new organism, a new, a new microbe? I will be, I'm, I'll be very curious to see how the, these big data sets that we have for existing microbes are going are gonna to enable, are going to simplify the process of building a new model um, for a new microbe. Oh, here's a fun one. Here's a fun one. Okay, I love this question. I love this question. Thinking about thinking about Ginkgo as an enabling uh, uh, platform technology for for founders interested in creating new companies in this space. What verticals would you recommend they build within? Should they think of Ginkgo as a platform to develop within? So, the second part, I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. Um, Jen, can you, um, so what do you, uh, uh, what, are, what, what are your thoughts on this? What verticals would we recommend people build within? I mean, I think it's important to remember that we're a, an industry agnostic platform, right? And, and we work across the, the biopharma space, food, flavors, fragrances, ag, especially chemicals, it can keep going on. And so, um, so, so really, you know, in, in terms of verticals, I would say in some cases, the world's your oyster. Like, where is there a real need? Where is there an opportunity for, for change um, or disruption via biology? I, I think there are really interesting verticals to explore. Uh, so maybe I'm not an advice giver on verticals, but uh, but there's a lot of options out there, I'll say. And in terms of sort of how you think about Ginkgo, I mean, yes, think of Ginkgo as sort of a... A, a toolkit, a platform to use as you develop products to bring to market in whatever vertical you choose, um, where, you know, the nice thing is on day one of forming your company, you don't have to find a lab space, buy some equipment, start to collect your own data and, and hire scientists. Like in many cases, you can leverage what you've already built to accelerate your R&D. And we've seen a number of of our customers uh, be able to bring products to market really, really rapidly because they've they've cut through that early, early, early on. So, um, yeah, think of us as sort of an accelerator, your inside R and D partner that you don't have to build yourself. Exactly. Yeah, I love that. I love that analogy for for Ginkgo. So, yeah, so we we do we work across. Uh, any industry that biology touches. So in that sense, we are, we're vertical agnostic, but also we have these unique capabilities. So maybe my advice to a new founder is uh, build, build your product around our, around our capabilities. Right. And I, I think uh, the, 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 the platform technologies that have been pioneered in tech, for example, Google have, have shown that that can be a really effective strategy. So you want to, if you're, a, if you're, a, if you're working in tech today, a good idea is to build your tech product around capabilities offered uh, by a platform like uh, like GCP, for example. Um, Scott, I'd be I'd, I'd I'd be curious to hear your take on this question. Are does does Google have in mind focal areas for for applications of AI in biotech? Like, for example, is is it for like cancer? metabolic disease, infectious disease, um, or if not, what, 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 what verticals, what applications are you, are you personally excited about, uh, lately? Well, I think go back to, uh, Tom Knight many years ago, right? Biology is becoming programmable, right? And we're, we're starting to just understand it and now we debug it and patch it and then maybe program it. And I think that has, huge wide ranging implications for the industry. And I, I see a very near future where in anything in the space from cancer to molecules, to flavors, to enzymes, to, you know, uh, textiles, you name it. Um, not doing something with Ginkgo is going to put you at a disadvantage in the sense that I can't imagine people in this space, not using Ginkgo every day, because I think that's where we see it heading in the sense that if it becomes a computational medium, what is your platform and the back end? So we worry about the bits and, and bytes and the networks. How about all the wet labs and how do you go between in silico and in situ and have a platform like that to do your science? 
I think that's where we're all headed. And that's why I think I'm really excited about this partnership because, you know, Tom and, and, and Cruz saw this very early on. And, you know, I saw maybe a little later, but I think it's, you know, these, these two industries are now coming together where you've got Silicon Valley coming together with the biology community and it's going to be a wonderful future. Very exciting. Very exciting. Uh, I, okay. So just, uh, I got, let's see, I'm, I'm browsing through the, the questions here. Um, Nicole, can I activate you for a quick one here? Um, this is, this one's going down a little bit into the technical weeds, but I, I like, that's where I live. I like it there. What does the actual data capture process look like? Swabs, shotgun sequencing. What's the turnaround time from gathering speci specimens, sequencing analysis? And reporting. Okay, so that's 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 super granular. But maybe tell me tell me a little bit about what the what the data capture process looks like, just for, uh, for an example in a in a biosecurity application. Yeah, so we're capturing um, individual nasal swabs um, as well as pooled nasal swabs um, for testing, um, as well as aircraft wastewater. Um, so aircraft wastewater is especially useful because we're able to see different places of the world um, in that data, um, which is neat. Um, the, it, goes, it undergoes both PCR and sequencing. Um, we are using um, enrichment panels for whole genome sequencing. Um, right now, the turnaround time um, is about a week, I think, a little less um, for sequencing um, for, between collection um, and results, PCR, obviously, uh, quite a bit faster. All right, thanks. Um, so, uh, looks like it's just about time to wrap up here, but I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Anna Marie have the last word here. Uh, how does AI change what is possible for our customers? Is this just another, another tool in our tool belt, uh, or is this a whole new world? Yeah, I think, look, I think it's already been a tool in our tool belt. Um, and it is it is going to continue to be a tool we will continue to deploy it across all of our customer programs. And, you know, there was a question that we didn't ask here about like, hey, Ginkgo's got amazing technology, but it's still too expensive. I I, I can't use it in, in my academic lab, for example. And like, that's something that still like breaks my freaking heart. <laughs> you know, like Ginkgo's goal is that we can reduce the cost of doing this work year over year over year at an exponential rate to make this technology accessible to all of the amazing ideas that are out there, whether it's in an academic lab, in a small startup, or in a large multinational corporation. One of the things I'm most excited about it with AI is that it does make some problems really cheap and easy and creates an interface to engage with the problem that is accessible to folks without a giant program team at Ginkgo overseeing that work on a day-to-day -day basis. And so, yeah, I think this has the potential to be a whole new world, one we're really excited about where we can enable new groups of people who've previously not been able to access this type of technology to access it um, over time. And I think it'll be a great new tool that, that we'll deploy across all of our programs. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, all right. And with that, I think it's time to wrap things up. I'd like to thank all the panelists who joined us today, Anna Marie, Jen, Dimitri, Seth, Nicole, and in particular, a big thanks to Scott, who came all the way from Google Cloud to join us. Uh, thank you so much to the audience members for your many interesting and provocative questions. If you're excited about AI, you want to start your AI-powered project on the Google Foundry, you can contact us at AI at GinkoBioWorks.com. Or immediately after this event, you will be redirected to our contact form. Tell us a little bit about your application area, and we will get you connected with someone who can help get your project onto the Ginkgo Foundry. And until next time, as we like to say around here at Ginkgo, let's grow. Bye-bye.